Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the uh, invitation. Um, and yes, just to reiterate, uh, questions or comments during the talk are encouraged. Um, so please do uh, interrupt me if there's anything. Okay, so today I'm talking about uh, this sort of rather vague title, so a density conjecture about um, unit fractions. And uh, right, there's lots of different kind of questions you could ask about unit fractions. Um, in particular, I'm going to sort of zoom in on the subset of questions about solutions to this equation. So um, we want the sum of distinct unit fractions equaling one. Um, all the NI here are assumed to be uh, distinct. Um, it's quite an important condition. And it's also good to stress that here, we're really thinking of R as being unbounded. So unlike many other sort of problems in additive combinatorics where you somehow fix your equation, um, in particular you fix the number of summands, here we're sort of fixing the shape of the equation, but in the sort of number of the summands, we don't really care about control. Indeed, it probably will grow quite rapidly. Uh, this is, so this is what some people have, I've heard call Waring's problem of degree minus one, uh, if you like to think of it that way. Okay, so uh, here are some examples, to solutions to this equation. So there's the trivial one, one over one. Uh, here's the slightly more interesting one, uh, one over two plus one over three plus one over six. Um, in a sense, this sort of comes from the fact that six is a perfect number. So sort of any perfect number um, in particular will give you a solution to this equation. Uh, but there are many, many more uh, types of solution to this equation. So for example, here's another one. So this is one that I found where all the denominators are primes plus one, I think. Yes, good. Okay, so uh, you can sort of restrict the denominators in all sorts of interesting ways. Uh, here's one where they're all odd. Um, and it's, okay, a little more, a little lengthier expression now. And I think nine summands is the best that you can do if you want all the denominators to be odd. Um, so there are a couple of different ways to do that though. So here's one. Uh, here's another one, for example, where all the denominators are two mod three. And finally, here's a sort of a lengthier one uh, found by Alan Johnson in 1978. Um, the significant thing about the denominators here, uh, to save you the trouble, is that they are all the product of exactly two primes. Uh, so this is sort of an interesting challenge is to find, um, sort of restrict the set of denominators in various interesting ways and find a solution to this equation. Um, and it was not certainly not obvious that you can do this where all the denominators are products of exactly two primes, but it can be done in several different ways. So here's, here's what is still currently, I think, the simplest, simplest way known. Um, and as the previous sort of, all right, so a couple of examples, so I've shown you can do it with all odd numbers, all two mod three and so on. So it's sort of no surprise, I guess, that every infinite arithmetic progression, um, you can restrict the denominators um, if you like, to any infinite arithmetic progression, where right? there's no sort of congruence obstructions to solutions to this equation. And that was proved, uh, as far as I can tell, first by Van Alberta and Van Linton in 1963. Um, but I think it may have been sort of rediscovered um, independently several times since. Um, and just to sort of reassure you that sort of we're not completely overrun with solutions, uh, there is, here's an observation, which is, is folklore. I think it, it goes back to when people were first asking this sort of question. It's also the observation that I can't have a solution with all denominators being primes, right? And this is just sort of a very simple, um, simple sort of congruence, uh, you know, sort of uh, multiply by the product of P1 up to PR and look at both sides mod P1, for example. Um, so in fact, I can replace one here by any integer and I still get the same problem. Okay. But so certainly we can't do this with the denominators restricted to uh, primes, but there aren't really very many primes in the, in the class of all numbers. And it certainly seems that if every arithmetic progression contains lots of solutions and I can restrict denominators in lots of interesting ways, then such solutions should be fairly sort of ubiquitous, fairly sort of common. And in particular, when you're given an equation with sort of quite a large family of different solutions, um, without any obvious congruence restriction, et cetera. I think it's natural to conjecture some sort of uh, Ramsey type property, um, which Ersch and Graham did. So in particular, they conjectured that if we color or partition the natural numbers into finitely many pieces, then one piece must contain a monochromatic solution to this equation. Um, and I, I guess here I'm restrict ignoring the trivial one where one over one equals one. So some non-trivial monochromatic solution. 
Okay, so I think this is a natural uh, question and they asked it um, several times. Uh, the earliest I could find at some point in the 70s, but um, who knows when informally it was first asked. And uh, I found this note, so here's sort of proof, I guess, uh, a, snap, a picture from notes by Erdős, um, which I found in an article with Ron Graham, where, for example, Erdős uh, talks about this conjecture. So color the con integers by k colors, and is it true that we can solve the, exactly this equation? And here Erdős is emphasizing, again, the number of summands is, is really allowed to grow. So this is sort of fairly different in that sense from Schur's theorem, Van der Verden's theorem, et cetera, where, again, the, the equation, the number of summands is fixed. And uh, this conjecture was solved by um, Ernie Krupp in, well, he solved it, I think, in his PhD thesis, 2000-2001, uh, but the article appeared finally in 2003 in Annals, um, and he proved exactly this conjecture. So if I partition the integers into finite and many pieces, then one piece must contain a monochromatic, a non-trivial monochromatic solution. Um, and in fact, Krupp proved a fairly reasonably sharp quantitative version so we prove that basically, so right. So if I'm, how large an interval do I need to go up to, if such that if I'm splitting it into k many pieces, then I can find a monochromatic solution. Um, well, certainly since the integers from say two up to e to the k, the sum of all their reciprocals is roughly k, then I can split that into uh, k many pieces such that the sum of reciprocals is each less than one. So certainly the, the sort of the size of the interval needed must grow at least exponentially in k. Um, so I think it's really quite surprising that in the first proof of this result, Krupp actually sort of proved this basically optimal exponential dependence. So I only need to go up to an interval of length exponential in K before I can be guaranteed to find a solution. Um, okay. And uh, in fact, sort of Krupp crunched some numbers and gave a... Uh, uh, explicit value for this constant, so e to the 167,000. Um, I think the main thing interesting about that is that it's possible, you know, it's not too hard to actually give an, an explicit constant and it's not crazy large. Um, and this is for sufficiently large k. And as I said, basically just considering a sort of a greedy coloring of the integers two up to a little bit less than e to the k shows that you can't do better than c equals e here. Probably you can get it down to something like basically e, e to the k. Um, I don't see why not. I think Krupp um, also conjectured this, um, certainly for large k. But as far as I know, no one's sort of really tried to improve this constant of, of Krupp since his original paper. Okay, so that's, that's Krupp's theorem. And I think given any sort of coloring statement, any Ramsey type statement, there's a corresponding uh, density statement, at least when there's no obvious congruence restriction. So we have Scher's theorem about solutions to x plus y equals z. There definitely is a Ramsey coloring statement for that. The, um, the odd numbers are an obvious sort of congruence obstruction stopping a density version being true, but without any sort of congruence restriction, um, there's no reason, you know, it's a natural guess to say, is the coloring version just true? Because in fact, the corresponding density statement is true. Is it the, is it the case that actually just taking the larger, largest of the color pieces always works? And uh, indeed, Edison Graham also considered this natural and they conjectured it as well. Um, it's sort of the same sort of um, period. Um, so they conjectured in particular, if A has positive density, uh, then you can find the solution. So here I've written low upper natural because in different places they conjecture different forms. So in one source I found, they said if it has positive lower density, in another if it has positive natural density or positive upper density, uh, which you know are, are different statements, you know, increasing in, uh, Obviously, the one for lower density, for example, implies the one for upper density, but not vice versa. Um, so I, th I think they were sort of changing their mind a bit, possibly, on, on what was reasonable to conjecture. Okay. Um, and also note that um, there are obvious congruence restrictions if I'm trying to represent, if I replace one here with a fraction P over Q, where the denominator is bigger than one, then there is a, I can sort of choose, for example, I can't represent one half of the sum of one over odd numbers. Um, so that sort of stops the density version being true for that. And also if I have this, if I need this conjecture for one, then it's trivial to deduce it for representing any natural number, right? Just take a solution for one out, find another solution for one, add them together and I've got two and so on. So really the only interesting conjecture of this form is, is where it equals one. So that's all I'm going to talk about. Everything else is either trivially false or, or trivially uh, 
corollary. Uh, and here's another sort of uh, snapshot from Erdrich's notes where, for example, he writes about this conjecture. So here, for, yes, if we have some sequence of positive lower density, is it true that basically we can find the solution? Okay. Uh, and that's the sort of the theorem I want to talk about today, uh, which is indeed a, a resolution of this, of this other conjecture of Erdrich and Graham. And I actually prove it in the strong form, so where we have set of positive upper density. Okay, so that implies in particular for positive natural density or positive lower density and so on. So if we have any set of positive upper density, then we can find a solution. And uh, in particular, the colouring result is an immediate corollary, right? We just take, take any colouring, look at the largest piece, it must have positive upper density. And because sort of, right, the logarithmic density is at most the natural density, um, we immediately deduce that, in fact, any set of positive logarithmic density contains a solution. And here we can give a quite a quantitative, precise quantitative um, control on what this is. So it takes the following form. So if I have some set of the, the numbers one up to n, such that the sum of their reciprocals grows basically faster than, right, so the trivial upper bound is, is log n on this. So I get um, log 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 n over log log n times the sort of trivial upper bound. So in particular, this is little o of log n. So that implies that it's sort of a quantitative form of saying the, um, if I have positive logarithmic density, then I'll contain a solution. But sort of given the nature of the um, equations that we're studying, I think it's quite natural to measure sets with this sort of weighting. Okay. Um, so in other words, we sort of, the natural measure for a set here isn't necessarily the size or the cardinality of the set. It's this logarithmic measure where I um, sum of some of the reciprocals in the set. So somehow the logarithmic density version of this question is I think more natural than the natural density version of the question. Okay. And speaking of quantitative issues, um, I'll introduce the following definition. So lambda of n is basically the largest sort of size of a set in this logarithmic weighting, um, which contains no solution. Um, so sum of reciprocals being one. So for example, uh, just to be comfortable with this concept, the trivial bounds are, we certainly must have lambda of n being at least one. Uh, if the sum of reciprocals sum to less than one, certainly we can't choose a subset summing to one. And sort of trivially, it's upper bounded by, well, the sum of all the reciprocals in one up to n, which is one plus little o one of the log n. And uh, in fact, Crute's method proved the way he proved this coloring statement. Um, in fact, you can deduce some, uh, a non-trivial upper bound on this. Um, so Crute proved the existence of some constant c less than one, some absolute constant, um, such that lambda of n is less than c times log n. For large enough n. Okay. And to detect solutions in sets of positive, I guess, logarithmic density is basically saying is lambda of n little o log n. So just to sort of restate the previous theorem in this lambda terms, um, we have lambda of n is big O log 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 n over log log n multiplied by log n, which is little o of log n. Okay, so this is, I think, quite an interesting function. I don't know how, um, how much attention it's received, uh, especially since Crute's paper. So I sort of partially wanted to advertise this, this function and um, encourage people to look at it. Um, in particular, I think the question of lower bounds is quite interesting. So as I said earlier, primes don't have a solution. So that gives us an immediate um, non-trivial, or perhaps this is the new trivial lower bound for lambda of n, which is basically log log n. Right. The sum of the reciprocals of primes grows like log log n. So lambda of n must grow also like log log n. And if we go back to this uh, handwritten note of Erdős, um, so it makes this observation here. So the primes show that the divergence is not enough. And he sort of says this, perhaps if basically, if the sum of reciprocals grows faster than log log n, then uh, maybe I can always find a solution, uh, which in our terms, is basically equivalent to uh, maybe lambda of n is in fact big O of log log n, right? So trivial lower bound is log log n, maybe it's in fact that is the correct order of growth. 
Um, in fact, it, it, it definitely grows faster than that. And the construction is not too difficult. Um, so primes are an obstruction to this uh, equation. And Pomerantz observed that in fact, um, you can do slightly better by taking n with very large prime factor. In particular, if you take the set of all n with a prime factor uh, bigger than n over log n, multiplied by some constant, um, then uh, sort of quite a nice short um, elementary argument shows that also there you can't find a solution to some of reciprocals being one uh, in, among such n either. So generally, having very large prime factors um, is clearly a problem for this sort of equation. And then if you do the analysis, this gives you log log n squared. So definitely, let lambda of n grows faster than log log n. Uh, but that basically is the extent of, of at least my knowledge um, and what I was able to find in the literature. If anyone knows, um, for example, an improvement on the lower bound, then please, please do let me know. But that's, that's the best that I, I have found. Um, so there's still quite a large gap between these bounds. And um, it's natural to ask, right, where does the truth lie? I think probably the lower bound is much closer to the truth than the upper bound in the sense that certainly I would be surprised if uh, lambda of n groove was not bounded above by log n to the little o1 somehow. Um, okay, if, if one were forced to make an explicit guess, I mean, who knows, probably e to the um, log 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 n squared or something, you know, one of these sort of weird intermediate functions. Um, but maybe it grows like some power of log log n, who knows. But certainly I think the lower bound is closer to the truth than the upper bound. Okay, so that sort of um, the, concludes the context and introductory part of the talk. And I'm going to go on to talk about uh, Crute's um, results in a bit more detail. Um, so perhaps this is a good point if anyone has any immediate questions. Or comments. Okay, I'll press on. So, as I say, Crute proved this coloring conjecture of Erdersham Graham. And in fact, he proved it via some kind of density statement, which was this. This is sort of the technically uh, full form of what Crute spends most of his paper proving. Um, and we're going to spend a few minutes looking at this statement just sort of to pass it. So um, we have delta plus theta are some fixed um, real numbers bigger than zero, such that their sum is less than a quarter. N is just taken to be large enough depending on delta and theta. A is a set of integers between N and N to the one plus delta, so that's the role that delta is playing. And then there are three um, sort of assumptions that we're going to put on our set A. Um, and we're going to talk about these assumptions one at a time, and then given these three assumptions, the conclusion is there exists some a solution to the equation we've been looking at. So the first assumption is that it's a kind of smoothness condition. It says that if a prime power divides some n, then that prime power is bounded above by n to the theta. So in particular, for example, this rules out a being a set of a being a set of primes. Um, this is a sort of smoothness condition, and so it's often said that such n are n to the theta smooth or n to the theta friable, uh, if you prefer the uh, alternative notation. Although with the important caveat, I guess that we're actually restricting not just primes, but prime powers here for this purpose. So normally when you talk about smoothness, you're only really restricting the size of the primes dividing it. Uh, here, it's, it's much more technically convenient to um, restrict sort of all prime powers as well. And this, the, the, the sort of condition comes up is quite, you know, it's not unexpected because we've already seen that problems for this kind of equation are the primes and integers with very large prime divisors. So it makes sense that if we want to find solutions, then sort of removing the possibility of very large prime divisors um, can only help. The second condition isn't particularly important. Uh, it just says that omega of n, which counts the number of distinct prime divisors of n, uh, is basically around log log n, which is fine because that is the expected size of omega of n anyway, right? This is known going back to, I guess, um, Hardy and Ramanujan and Turan uh, and that sort of era. Uh, and in fact, we have very, very sharp control by the erdos cac theorem, right? We know basically exactly what the distribution of omega of n minus log log n is. It looks like a normal distribution and we get you know, almost all integers n 
have this property. Um, Hi, um, I have a question. Sorry, yeah. uh, what is n in little n in the second condition? Sorry, yeah, that's for all n and a as well. I yeah. Be. Okay. Yeah. So all n and a are sort of typical in this sense. Thank you. Um, and yeah, so that in practice. I also have a question. Yeah. Um, I was just wondering, since Kruth's proof, was anyone able to relax any of these? I mean, obviously the first condition cannot be relaxed, but maybe the second was anyone able to, to was anyone successful in reducing the con you know weakening the conditions um so the second condition um as, as, I, as far as i know no one's improved it or, or removed it but um as this shows it's it's not clear what one would gain by doing so right because this is true for almost all then anyway so uh, okay. it's not really an important restriction the third one we're about to talk about is really also very weak. It's the first one that is significant. And in fact, um, as I'll talk about later, I actually do improve this condition. And that's basically how I prove the theorem oh, okay. I mentioned earlier. By, Thank you. Uh, so a weaker here. condition and a stronger result is what you did. Exactly, yes. Um, okay. So sort of, spoiler for a few, a few minutes time, what I did is, is I weakened condition one, basically. OK, thank you. But we'll, we'll see that in a few minutes. Um, so yes, so the, the second condition on the number of prime divisors of n is, is really not important at all. You can just basically forget it, and I will for the rest of the talk. But it's always sort of there in the background. But in practice, the set of such n which fail this condition is really zero density by quite a wide margin. So you know, begin by just throwing away that from your set A, uh, and you can assume it's always true. And the third condition, so obviously the sum of the reciprocals of A should be at least one. For us to have a chance of this working. And I think it's quite surprising that, in fact, just greater than six um, is, is enough, right? This is incredibly weak, considering the fact that if I sort of the set of all numbers between, um, you know, n and n to the one plus delta is, you know, grows, um, I guess, you know, like some basically like delta log n or something, um, then yeah, I think it's, we, we, it's much, much weaker than what you might expect. Um, right, this, we're not even at the lower, the lower bound here doesn't even go to infinity, it's actually some fixed reasonable constant. Um, so yeah, conditions two and three aren't very important, it's condition one that's the real um, restricting factor in Crute's theorem. So informally, um, ignoring conditions two and three, this basically says um, that if A, or this implies certainly, that if A is a positive density set, such that all elements of n and a are n to the one quarter smooth, then there exists a solution. Okay. So in particular, this implies a coloring result, right? Because if I've colored all the integers, then I just, in particular, I've colored all the smooth integers of which there's a positive proportion. And then I just look at the largest piece of those. Okay. So actually what Crute did is he did prove a density result from which he deduced the coloring result, but with this important restriction that this sort of n to the one quarter smoothness hypothesis was added as well. And I think once one sort of sees, right, so what Crute actually proved in this form, uh, it's a lot more, it seems a lot more feasible um, improving this coloring result to a density result, because all one has to do uh, is lift up this smoothness threshold. Right, so lift it from basically n to the one quarter smooth to n to the one minus little o one smooth. Okay, that's because again, sort of standard um, basic analytic number theory tells us that almost all n are that smooth. Right, very few n are prime, very few n have a very large prime divisor, and so on. So we really just need to improve this quarter to the little o one to one minus little o one, and then we get the full unrestricted density version. Uh, and in particular, I sort of want to stress that this gap is much, much shorter than other sort of, you know, coloring the density results like Van der Verden's result about arithmetic progressions proved in the 20s. And then, you know, it was uh, a long, long time before Zemmerady um, found a way to prove the density version of this. So any positive density subset as arithmetic progressions. Um, and that sort of is a completely different task than prove, proving the coloring result, right? Van der Verden's proof or the standard proof of van der Verden's coloring results is sort of quite explicit, combinatorial, and actually uses the sort of pigeonhole principle, uh, and it just fails completely for um, getting a, trying to get a density result. You have to use much stronger, different methods. 
to get the corresponding density results. Unlike the case here, Crute's methods that he already used to prove the coloring result actually prove a kind of restricted density result. So it's you know, not too surprising that you can uh, push those methods a little further and weaken this smoothness hypothesis to get the uh, unrestricted density result. And that's exactly what I do. So I definitely, I, I basically sort of take everything Crute did, take his method and just push it a little bit further to get this smoothness um, hypothesis weakened. Okay, so in the rest of the talk, I'm sort of going to try and talk about Crute's uh, method um, and um, sort of point to a couple of places uh, in which uh, I've had to uh, improve it slightly. The proof is sort of, there, there's no sort of very short uh, sort of one sentence or two sentence summary of, oh, this is the, the grand insight behind the proof. Um, there's sort of lots of um, elementary, but I think very technical manipulations that one has to make. I think lots of very entertaining um, diversions um, in analytic number theory, uh, which sadly, um, I will, so I don't have the time to get into all of, uh, or even most of sort of the interesting details in how the proof works. Um, but I'm of course happy to talk about it um, in questions afterwards if anyone has any particular problems. But I'll try to give you a flavor at least about the kind of uh, sub problem that I, at least, I guess that come up when I'm going through Crute's method and the starting point. So the starting point is Fourier analysis. Okay, and this is um, a reasonably natural thing to do, right? I mean, this is one of the main tricks that uh, number theorists have in how can we um, prove the existence of a solution to some equation will in fact count the number of solutions to such, a, such an equation, prove it's greater than zero. How will we count the number of solutions? We'll use Fourier analysis or orthogonality, um, circle method or however you like to call it. Okay, so the application of the circle method is possibly a little um, less immediate in this case, right? We're talking about the sum of reciprocals, um, but it, it's sort of not too hard, a couple of elementary manipulations um, and you can prove the following uh, counting relationship. So here A is a finite set of integers and P denotes its lowest common multiple. Then if we sort of do this average over all characters, basically sort of modulo P of these Fourier coefficients. So I'm here taking the product of all N in A, one plus E of R over N. Um, so sorry, I haven't written it here. I just realized that but E is the sort of standard notation of analytic number theory where E of X is E to the two pi I X. Um, so you can sort of see what's gonna happen if we expand out this product, then we're gonna sum over all the different subsets of A and one over N summed over that subset. And then sort of with this sort of phase R and then by orthogonality, what that's gonna end up counting is all this S and A subsets such that the sum of reciprocals in that subset is a natural number. Okay. So sort of that's a natural thing that Fourier analysis counts. So it's reasonable to object at this point and say, well, that's great, but that's possibly counting something much larger. What I want is that sum of reciprocals to be equal to one, not just equal to any natural number. Um, okay, so I respond as, as Crete did by, sort of the rather cheeky maneuver of just saying, well, I'm just gonna insist that the whole sum of reciprocals is less than two, right, from where I started. Okay, so let's say between one and two. Then in particular, if the sum of any subset of reciprocals is a natural number, it must be either zero or one. I know which ones give me zero, it's just the empty sum. So it's just exactly one of those. So the left-hand side is now basically one plus the sum of all the solutions to sum of reciprocals being equal to one. Um, okay, so this sort of all applies when the sum of reciprocals in A is basically somewhere between one and two. Okay, so given a Fourier expression, we now just want to show that this is something strictly greater than zero. Uh, a standard next step in Fourier analysis is to say, well, isolate some sort of main term where we can calculate the Fourier coefficients exactly, and then show that everything else is an error term. Uh, in this case, there is basically only one term that we now have to calculate exactly. We have very little information about A, so it's just R equals zero. It's the only sort of Fourier coefficient on the right that we really can say uh, much about with confidence. So the R equals zero term, so each sort of term in the product is going to be exactly just two. Uh, so the 
Fourier coefficient is going to be two to the size of a. So overall, this will contribute two to the size of a divided by p to the right-hand side. So that's sort of the only main term we can reasonably extract. Okay, so is this fairly large? Well, if a is a positive density subset of one up to n, and every n in a is reasonably smooth, so this is already where some kind of smoothness assumption comes in, in bounding p, because if a is, if every n is n over log n smooth, then p is at most e to the big O n over log n. In particular, it's, um, which is two to the little o of a. Okay. So already we need some kind of smoothness restriction here, although albeit quite a mild one, uh, just because if a is sort of, if all possible primes up to n appear somewhere in dividing an element of a, then p will grow like e to the um, n, which is, so there's two to the a divided by p term, that's already going to be much less than one, which is bad for us, right? We want to get this count over one. Um, but a very mild smoothness restriction takes care of that already. So the main term then under this very mild smoothness assumption is basically contributing two to the one minus little o one times the size of a, which is definitely bigger than one for large n, assuming again a is a reasonably large subset of one. Okay. So it's interesting to note, by the way, that um, sort of Crute's proof, just like many proofs in Fourier analysis, in fact, they don't just give you one solution to this equation, they'll give you basically exponentially many. Um, so you can find many, many monochromatic solutions um, to this equation. Okay, so therefore our task is to show that the rest of the sum from R are not equal to zero, uh, so it's minor arcs, if you like, are a small error term, right? They don't, they don't, uh, they are negligible, so they don't remove that contribution. So basically, we need to show that for all r um, greater than zero and at most p over two, this Fourier coefficient here is little o of the main term, which is two to the size of a over p. Okay, that's kind of bound that we would need to prove. And simplifying, um, okay, so right, uh, you know, cosine as the sum of exponentials and remove a factor of two from each product. And it's basically saying the product of cosine of pi r over n over all n inside a has to be little o of one over p. Okay, so sort of the left-hand side is trivially somewhere between the zero and one, and we need to make sure that we get sort of the total decay at least as fast as, or strictly faster than one over p for any fixed non-zero r. Okay, so let, let's just suppose henceforth that all the n inside a of a have roughly the same sort of size. They're all roughly capital. Okay, so the first step, um, or the next step rather, is, okay, we want to show that this sort of product of cosines is small. So let's approximate the cosine using its Taylor series. And so, and then the exponential. So roughly cosine of x is around e to the minus x squared over two for small x. So using that sort of approximation, um, it's basically, we want to look at the product of cosine pi r over n, because periodicity only really matters what r is modulo little n. So I'm gonna write r sub n for sort of the uh, reduced residue class of r modulo n. And basically then what we need is log p to be big O of one over n squared times the sum over n and a of r n squared. Okay. And again, this is sort of for any fixed non-zero r, I reduce r modulo n to get this rn between minus n over two and n over two. And I want to make sure that the sort of average of the squares, if you like, is reasonably large. So if all the n in a are n to the theta smooth, then log p um, grows no faster than n to the theta. So again, this is where uh, a stronger smoothness hypothesis comes in handy. Um, so it's enough if basically, if I sum for any fixed R non-zero, if I sum Rn squared over all N and A, that has to be bigger than N to the two minus theta. Okay, so again, sort of lots of formulas, but the point here is that's basically what, the nat what it naturally transforms into if I just ask, I want all of these non-zero R to give me some negligible error term. 
this is basically the, nat what the natural corresponding bound. Okay, so that's just this previous point repeated. And okay, so how are we going to get this lower bound? I want the sum of Rn squared to be fairly large. I can ensure that if the following is true. There is some k, some choice of parameter k, such that for every interval of length k, there are at least n to the two minus theta over k squared, many n in a, that don't divide any element of my interval. Okay, why is that true? Well, take r and take your interval of length k centered at r. Now, saying that n does not divide anything in that interval is exactly saying that rn is greater than k. Right? It's saying that basically uh, n is, or rather r, is not within distance k of a multiple of n. Right? That's just sort of what it means. Okay. And then if I plug that in, that means on this sum here, I have at least n to the two minus theta over k squared many n, such that rn is basically k. So that will give me the required lower bound on rn. But I have a lot of flexibility here in what I choose k. I might choose it to be fairly small. So in other words, I want this lower bound to be true because there are very few uh, n such that rn is very, very large. Or maybe I want to choose it to be larger. Um, so this lower bound is sort of true because there are, are um, many n where that's of medium size, if that makes sense. So, right, so some technical manipulations, but the key point is, and again, this is all that all was done by Crute, the initial problem of finding a solution of, to this sort of unit fraction equation has gone by going for analysis, become a problem of this sort of finding multiples in an interval sort of question, right? I want to know that, is it true that for every interval, I can find many things, many N and A that don't divide anything in that, in that interval. Okay, so that's slightly cumbersome to say out loud, but a fairly, I think, natural sort of combinatorial problem. Um, so basically, we want to sort of want to find sets with the following property. We want to rather show that A has the following property. So we want to show that every interval of length k, either there are at least L many n and a that don't divide any element of the interval, or there is some element of the interval divisible by every n and a. Okay. So that's sort of the key property we're going to focus in on here. And note that's actually stronger, or rather that's different from what I said on the previous slide in two ways. First of all, I'm saying it's for every interval of length k, right? I'm not saying for every interval inside zero up to p over two, I'm saying it's for every interval of length k now. And also I'm not saying that it's always necessarily this first case. So we find many NA that don't divide anything in the interval, but either that first case holds or there is some element of the interval divisible by every n and a. And the point is for our application, actually the second possibility can never happen, right? Because then if we have an element of an i divisible by every n and a, then it's divisible by p, because p is the lowest common multiple of a, uh, but it can't because i is between zero, is an interval inside zero up to p over two, so it can't contain a multiple of p. So it's just technically convenient to sort of look at this, this condition instead. Okay, so now we're not sort of restricting where our intervals lie. We're saying there can be any interval at all. And we just want to know how many sort of, or rather look at the multiples of elements of A inside this interval. So the upshot is for the Fourier analysis above to work and find solutions to what we want, we need A to be enter the theta smooth. So I haven't said what theta is yet, I get to choose theta. And it has to be basically k n to the two minus theta over k squared good. Okay, so for every interval of length k, either there exist at least n to the two minus theta over k squared n and a that don't divide any element of the interval, or there are some element of the interval divisible by every n and a. Okay. That's the kind of property that we need for this Fourier analysis to work. Okay, again, it's fairly technical. Um, but I think the main thing to take away is that by going through this Fourier analytic argument, we've transformed basically our initial number theoretic finding solutions to an equation problem into a much more sort of direct combinatorial question about how are sort of the multiples of A distributed, which seems 
at least not, not necessarily easier, but at least, you know, there's a lot more things you can play around with that and, and explore. It seems more tractable. Okay. And basically this is, again, this is all what Krut's proof strategy. So uh, he's key step in his proof is showing that maybe A itself isn't good in this required sense, but if not, you can pass to some large subset of A, which is going to be good um, by sort of an elementary argument. Okay, so what is this elementary argument? So let me just sort of simplify things slightly. So here, condition one says that there are many n and a that don't divide any x in i. Uh, let me simplify that by saying, well, um, suppose it's actually all n and a that don't divide any, or rather, no n. Suppose it's no n and a that divide any element of i. So sort of the strong form of being good for uh, expository purposes is the following. I want to know that if an interval i is such that all n and a divide some element of the interval, then there is some element of the interval divisible by all n and a. That's roughly what being good is saying. It's basically saying we can swap the quantifiers, right? So certainly um, the second part to implies the first, if there's some element of the interval divisible by all n and a, then all n and a divide some element of the interval, but the converse in general is not necessarily true at all. Okay, but basically what Crick proves is that in the sort of quantitative sense, if I'm allowed to pass through a large subset and I have some sort of smoothness going on, then in fact, this is true. Okay, so here's sort of a very rough sketch of how he does so. So suppose we have some interval i such that all elements of my set divide some element of my interval, but the point is they could be different for different n. So in particular, for any prime p that divides some element of my, a, in my um, set, uh, Krut shows that I can find some x in p, m, x p in i divisible by p. Okay, that's immediate from the first point, but even more so, it's not just divisible by one in n and a, it's divisible by many different n and a. Okay, so that's some very sort of clever elementary initial sort of reductions um, that I don't really have time to get into. But in particular, XP is divisible by many N and A. So roughly saying this XP has many, many divisors. What one can then show you from that is that in particular, XP has many prime divisors in, the set, in this sort of weighted sense. If I, so Q here is restricted to prime powers. So if I sum one over Q of all prime power divisors of XP, that grow has to grow at least like E to the minus one log log N. So that is roughly, I don't know, whatever, 0.37 or something times log log n. And considering the sum of one over q over all prime powers inside of our, in our, our range, it's like basically one plus little o one times log log n, that's sort of a reasonable percentage of all possible prime powers we could be talking about live inside xp, right? So over a third of all prime powers in our universe, in fact, divide xp. So xp is sort of quite rich in that sense. Now, of course, that's for any fixed prime p dividing the element of a. It might be different for different primes. If not, if it's all the, if these might be the same, if they're all the same, or if all these xp are equal to the same x, then I'm done, right? Because then this is an element of my interval divisible by all the primes, which divide something in a, and in particular by all the n inside there. Okay. Now, as I said, but then maybe they're different. But they can't be too different because, because each XP contains, if you like, over a third of the, the sort of reciprocal mass of all the prime powers, there can't be more than, well, there can't be more than two of them, right? Basically because three over E is greater than one. So I can't have, and they can't really overlap, they can't share too much of the same mass because if I, if I, if I have two different things inside the same interval, an interval of width at most N, then the sum of one over Q, over all sort of prime powers that divide them both is little o log log n. It's very small, I can show. So basically, if I have three different candidates for different xps, um, each of which has strictly greater than a third of the mass, then that's a contradiction. Therefore, I can have at most two of them. If I've got one, again, I'm done, I'm very happy. Having two is a genuine possibility, but basically then you just sort of split a according to which of the two sort of x1 and x2, which of the two n and 
which of the two x's n divides, and then you've got sort of, you look at the largest of the other two pieces, and then your argument works okay on that piece instead. Okay, so that's a further iterative step. But so I guess this is the key point I wanted to stress is this idea about um, you find an XP and then you show that the XP has a large greater than a third amount of, of the total mass available. Therefore, already that sort of forces a lot of the coalescing of the different XPs into just one or two different camps. So that's sort of roughly how Crute obtains this sort of goodness property. And uh, okay, so if one sort of runs through the above argument carefully, then you can show that every set with reasonable properties, so it's large, it's smooth, etc., then it contains a large subset which is good. So k times k to the n minus theta good turns out to be what that argument sort of delivers if k is in this range. And what we needed it to be for the Fourier analysis to work was k times k n to the two minus theta over k squared good. Right, so comparing sort of the two, this is what we need, this is what the combinatorial argument gets us. So this sort of is fine, as long as if we choose, say, k to the n to the two thirds, which means that theta has to be at most a third. Okay, because k has to be at most n to the one minus theta over two. So this smoothness threshold, this can't really work past n to the one third. Okay, so if one optimizes Krupp's method um, and really sort of pushes it, um, then you can improve the smoothness threshold from groups n to the one quarter to n to the one third. So that's, that's better, but it's still far short of the goal, right? We need n to the one minus the flow one. Okay, so how do we get around this and improve the smoothness threshold all the way up to n to the one minus the flow one? Basically, we do all of the above, but locally. Okay, so recall that the definition of good said that uh, for all intervals i, or some fixed length k, either there are many n and a that don't divide any element of the interval, or there are some elements of the interval divisible by every element of the set. What we're going to do is split that up. And if you actually, and it's reasonable, because if you look at the sort of Crutes method for doing this, you sort of naturally split it up anyway, right? You, you find this x by considering one prime at a time. So it's natural to introduce this sort of localness from the beginning in the hypothesis. So here's what you could think of as a local version of goodness. So again, we want for every interval of length k, if I now consider the set of all primes p such that, okay, so p have to divide many elements of a. So let's say the number of all n and a, which are divisible by p is at least a over p, right? Sort of reasonably what we'd expect. And if there are um, not too many n and a that are divisible by p that don't divide any elements of the interval, so here, instead of l, I have an l over p threshold. So my threshold, my, the sort of set I'm considering locally depends on p, it's just the set of all those multiples of p, but also is this sort of threshold about how many um, sort of bad n I want is also changing with p as well. And the point is, if I choose that di of all primes p, then I want there to be some x in i divisible by every prime in di. Okay, so uh, it, it takes a, a few minutes to, to see this, I think, and we have a few minutes. Um, but so just take my word for it that this does indeed sort of generalize the previous notion of goodness. So the previous notion of goodness, we didn't care about n in a that p divided n, was just we're looking at counting all n in a with these sort of properties. And instead of this sort of, changing factor L over P, we just had some sort of fixed cutoff L, and then DI was just the set of all primes, right? So this is why we got some X and I divisible by all primes that divided something in A, therefore by everything in A. But sort of, I guess the, the slogan form of this is you sort of consider this goodness property locally for sort of all these sort of popular primes. Now, what one can get because one, one has a sort of a local version of goodness, the bounds on this Fourier coefficient here now depend on this set di. Okay. Um, so in particular, they come out to the following, but the key point here is what bound we're getting now on these Fourier coefficients isn't sort of absolute. We're not saying 
that this Fourier coefficient for any non-zero r is little o1 over p. We have the same sort of bound for all these non-zero r. What we have is a bound that depends on this set di. In particular, it depends on the sum of 1 over p for all the primes not inside this di. So in particular, as sort of the di increases, um, th this bound gets worse and worse in quality. Okay. Um, now again, in the sort of the global version of goodness, basically what's going on is that di is a set of all primes dividing some element of a. So either or, or it was empty. Basically you had sort of this immediate flip over. If it was empty, that's great. We had this good bound for all r. Could it ever be not empty? Well, if it was not empty, it had to be all primes dividing element of a, and then r would have to be a multiple of p, which is what we ruled out earlier. Okay. So sort of by introducing this local version of goodness, uh, the bound changes in quality depending on this set d. Okay. So that's, and in particular, this bound, so sort of if I say for all r, what's the worst this bound can be, it can be pretty bad. Certainly too bad for this naive, um, just trying to write down Crute's argument in the same way would work. But we're saved because we can observe that the very notion of goodness tells us that every r is close to a multiple of all the primes inside dir. So as sort of dir increases, it takes up more and more of the available primes, our bound becomes worse, the sort of the bound available, but the number of r on which we need to apply that bound becomes smaller. Right? because every such r is close to a multiple of all the primes inside dir, dir. As dir gets bigger, there are fewer and fewer such multiples inside zero up to p over two. Okay, so there's this sort of trade-off going on. But that's fine, because if we go, sort of go all the way back up, uh, what we actually needed to show is not just this, but this on average over all non-zero r, that's all we needed to show, right? We didn't need this point-wise bound. We just needed to show that the contribution to this right-hand sum here from all r non-zero was in total small, which means that I only really need to bound the L1 average, if you like, of these Fourier coefficients, not the L-infinity norm. Great. So that means that actually this is fine. Um, because the bound on this row coefficient is becoming smaller, but the number of r where that we have to apply that weaker bound is also going down, and these sort of trade off um, in a way that cancel each other out. So we still get basically the same bound on the average of all these Fourier coefficients. Okay, and I'm sort of going to I'll, I'll, I'll finish there. As I said there are many technical things I haven't even mentioned or certainly brushed over because I basically just wanted to emphasize what in my view is the main source of the improvement over Crute's result. So what Crute, uh, the way Crute proved it was he applied for analysis to transform it into a combinatorial problem about uh, given sort of Fenny interval, what, how, the, how the multiples of N and A distributed in that interval. And then it was basically trying to control it. And you can't control that. Um, you can't guarantee you can control that for the whole set if you're set as large prime divisors. But if instead we basically break up the argument and consider each prime separately, then one gets bounds of varying quality depending on the primes. And that's actually fine because all we needed was an L1 bound in this sort of Fourier analytic argument, not an L infinity bound. Right? So the occurrence of very large prime divisors, which um, would sort of um, look spell trouble for Crute's original approach if I had a prime divisor say uh, you know like size n to the one half then that possibly might cause problems but in fact it's not a problem because it can only cause problem it can only uh, cause problems for not too many different r so the number of r's for which it's a problem is small so on an l1 sense it's not a problem at all okay so that's sort of the the brief slogan of in, in my view, at least, uh, sort of the, the main difference that from uh, my paper over Crutes in terms of what allows me to get this stronger smoothness statement. Okay, and I'll stop there. Um, thank you and for further questions and, and comments. Thank you. <laughs>